Hello, I'm Otto Zuber Skerritt, the editor of a series of monographs on Australian playwrights and the producer of this series of video programs in which you will see and hear the playwrights themselves speak about their work. I'm sure it will make your study of Australian drama much more interesting if you can see the playwrights, hear them speak and learn from them personally about their thoughts, views and feelings. I think that these video programs will help you better understand and appreciate the author's work and analyze and interpret their writings. Each video program is designed to supplement the written monograph. If you do not have these books, they may be obtained from this address. This is the first video program in the series entitled Australian Playwrights Speak. The playwright is Louis Naura from Sydney and the interviewer is Dr. Veronica Kelly, lecturer in the English department at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Louis, when and how did you begin writing for theatre? I think the origins of my playwriting career begin in the time when I was at uh, university. This was the time of the Vietnam War and uh, we used to do protest plays. We had a street theatre group and because I was the only one who could type, I used to write the plays. At that time I didn't want to become a playwright, I wanted to either write novels or write poetry. When I left university I rewrote one of my street theatre pieces and sent it off to the experimental theatre of the time in Melbourne called La Mama. They put it on in 1973, when I was 23. It wasn't very good. I was quite embarrassed and humiliated by it all. Uh, but I was bitten by the bug of writing plays. And then I wrote a couple more one-act ones. One, Death of Joe Wharton, which was considered scandalous and was not put on at the time. And another, Albert Names Edward, which was eventually put on at La Mama. And then I wrote a full-length play, Inner Voices, which I wrote before I went to live in Munich in 1976. When I got back from Munich, it was put on at the Nimrod Theatre, which is in Sydney, and proved to be quite successful and then went all around Australia and then overseas. Yes, that's very interesting. What writers do you believe that you have learned from, or what writers do you currently admire as dramatists? This, a lot of people believe that I have been influenced by Brecht or Bond. I, I think the influences probably go back a little earlier. My uncle, Bob Herbert, was a stage director, stage manager for J.C. Williamson's, which was a, an entrepreneurial theatre company in Australia. And I used to see a lot of American musicals when I was young, Can Can, Cherry Blossom Show, My Fair Lady. And so I, I always remember being tremendously attracted towards the short, concise scenes, the idea of song inside um, the plays and colour and movement and the idea that plays could be set anywhere. That was a huge influence that meant that when I finally began to see plays by Bond or Brecht or Arden, I was sort of open to that, for want of a better word, anti-naturalistic play. Later, um, you know, I began to like other plays by Pinter or, or whatever. Um, but I can't sort of pinpoint influences of these playwrights particularly. I, I really read more novels and poems than I do plays. Louis, does this anti-naturalistic background in musical theatre have anything to do with the construction and stylistic decisions of your own plays? How do you go about writing a play? I, I used to go about writing a play in a, in a way that I, I learned from uh, Nabokov, which was to actually use index cards. I always thought that I was very poor on the structure of my plays and what I used to do was to write out the scenes in index cards and shuffle them around on a large table. Therefore to try and get a, because I don't write plots, to try and get a narrative that was strong and had drive and also to try and get my scenes as brief and concise as possible. I think that one of the things I did learn from musicals and also Bond and Brecht was the idea that you get straight to the point in a scene, you try to make them resonant instead of supplying everything. Lately, of course, I don't use this anymore because I found uh, this technique anymore because I found my plays were rather too tight. They weren't loose enough. They didn't have enough air in them, as it were. So I've 
tried to develop a rather looser sense of structure and um, attach perhaps a stronger plot to them. Um, how has collaboration with specific companies and directors contributed to the reception and the production of your plays? For instance, you've written a lot for significant actors like Kate Fitzpatrick who took the star part in Visions and Kerry Walker, Robin Nevin who took the role in The Precious Woman, Judy Davis in one of your translations. Lulu, how has this kind of collaboration with other theatrical artists assisted your own work? In the beginning it was very difficult because I, uh, my first three plays were directed by three different theatre companies, three different directors. Uh, I didn't have that consistency. The good thing was after a time I developed um, a consistency with directors and with uh, stage companies. With actors it's very interesting, for example Judy Davis, uh, the star of my brilliant career, she's been in three of my plays and um, she's been a, an interesting actress for my plays because I deal a lot with repressed characters and she's able to give across that quality of repression and breaking forth from the bonds of repression same as Kerry Walker, and that's been a great help to work with these actresses because they understand what I'm getting at. Kate Fitzpatrick, who's been in two of my works, is another interesting actress who has also determined sometimes the way lead female characters talk. She has a um, very good wit, and she's able to give a lot of power to some of my comic lines. This can have unfortunate um, consequences in that when I wrote my play Inside the Island, the actress who was playing the lead character, Lillian Dawson, found that um, she couldn't say the lines. I had unconsciously written the part for Case Fitzpatrick. Mm -hmm. With um, directors, I found that by working with directors like Neil Armfield, a young director, or Jim Sharman, or Rex Cramphorn a few times, is that they've been able to understand my vision, uh, which is sometimes a very visual vision on stage, and be able to um, give that across to the audience. I've especially liked working with uh, the composer Sara de Jong uh, for most of my plays because she's been able to understand the type of music that I want and she's been able to teach me how to use music. The unfortunate aspects that I don't think that I've really had the designers that I've really wanted. Um, in the play Visions I felt that the design worked because Luciano Righi got across the idea of um, that this was a European vision of Paraguay and that showed in the set and the costumes. And in Sunrise, Geoffrey Gifford um, did a marvellous set for the play which was set in an Australian country home, the upper class country home. And he got across that aspect that it was an island within this dreary Australian landscape, an island of privilege of a, and of a beautiful garden. He got that across. But then again, I think the unfortunate aspect is not having worked with many designers twice, unlike directors or actors. Lua, you're a fairly anomalous writer in terms of Australian theatre writing because you've also translated plays from the non-English repertoire. For example, when you were working for the Sydney Theatre Company in 1979 and 1980, you translated The Lady of the Camellias from Dumas Fils and Serrano de Bergerac by Rostand. And then when you moved to work in the Lighthouse Theatre Company in Adelaide, uh, you did two plays from the German repertoire, the Lulu plays from Wiedekind and also The Prince of Homburg by Kleist. What attracted to you to these plays and do you think they have any actual affinities with your own work? With the first two, the French plays, really they were one to, ones to earn bread and butter. I was, though I did become interested in the, in the uh, Dumas Fils one because it was a turning point in French theatrical history. Unfortunately, my translation wasn't good enough to bring across the, the novel aspects of this particular work. With the Cyrano, again, I, I was uh, commissioned to do it and I enjoyed doing it, um, principally because I was attracted towards somehow trying to do translate a play that was written in the 1890s that was about the um, 17th century and was going to be put on Australia in the 1980s. So that little dance seemed to attract me. The, the Vedican plays were interesting as I lived in Schwabin and I became interested in Vedican when I was in Germany. And like a lot of playwrights, you're tempted towards this glorious mess to somehow try and turn it into a unified single play that makes sense. I was on um, one of the numerous lines of failures in this respect. 
In Germany, I also fell in love with uh, the playwright Heinrich von Kleist. Um, this was the time when I really did want to translate a play, which was The Prince of Homburg, and I had this glorious project in mind, which was to translate and direct all of Heinrich von Kleist's plays in Australia. Unfortunately, this project stopped with The Prince of Homburg. Um, I, th I figure it was a good production, and I enjoyed translating it, but for Australian audiences, uh, German romanticism is still a very foreign idea and it stopped in its tracks. The affinity that I feel is, um, I think I've learnt a lot from going through a theatrical history, mm. um, learning from these playwrights, that has given me a sense of structure. With the Heinrich von Kleist, I um, developed a very close affinity with his work, the sense of irrationality and rationality commingling within one person, and that taught me a lot. And also, his use of language, um, the rather convoluted way that he had of having his characters speak reminds me sometimes of not only my characters but myself. Your plays have been produced outside of Australia, haven't, haven't they? What is your attitude to this? Well, all I'm really interested in are the royalties. Um, unfortunately, there is a, a strand in Australian theatre history which regards overseas success for Australian plays as being more important than their premieres in Australia. We suffer from the Canadian syndrome, as it were, where they regard success on Broadway as being more important than success in Toronto, say. And so my interest is really um, in the Australian premiere, and from then on, um, I'm glad that countries overseas want to put on my work, but really I'm not that interested. In terms of current theatre writing in Australia, how do you see your theatre as fitting into current trends in terms of style and, and of material? Yes, a lot of people seem to regard me as being an outsider. I think one of the reasons for this is that I was not part of the first wave of new Australian playwrights that began in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Their concerns were to try and develop an Australian language that was middle class, colloquial, that belonged to them, and try and write plays for the new affluent Australian middle class and with nationalistic impulses. This was, of course, a great development because in Australia at the time we were basically copying English repertory theatre. Because I was not part of this first wave and was not concerned with what they were concerned with because I thought they did it well enough, uh, my concerns became more, uh, as it were, of an international nature. I regard Australia as being part of the world, not as a little continent or island. And so my interest developed in writing plays not only set in Australia but outside Australia, and I didn't regard myself as being a traitor to do these sort of plays. I think the other thing is that um, I'm a different playwright in that I, I write plays that could be called epic or open, they have large casts, and in Australia this is not a, um, a trend that is welcomed because theatre companies find the plays expensive to put on, they don't like putting them on. And Australian plays have generally been small cast, even to having a tradition of monologues that are easy to put on, cheap to put on. And so I certainly don't belong to that strand of playwriting. There is a context in which your own theatre can be seen as relating to a lot of theatre writing which is occurring abroad. For instance, in England, there's the writers David Hare and Trevor Griffiths, both of whom in their various ways have done studies of post-colonial society. For instance, Griffith's television play, Country, is like your own sunrise in examining a kind of a crisis in a society through a prominent family. And David Hare, too, has done a tele play, Saigon, the Year of the Cat, which deals with Vietnam, which is surely, you know, a subject very much on the Australian agenda, too. How do you see your own theatre as fitting into this sort of general sense of where the culture is going? I've always been a person who has been interested in Australia as being a colonial um, country. We're a country that has suffered from not only English cultural imperialism but American cultural imperialism. And I hear I'm talking about white Australians. Mm -hmm. Black Australians are, are rooted in the land and their culture has developed out of a close connection with the land. But in Australia, and we have been affected by other cultures to a great degree, and so I'm fascinated by this sort of inherent imperialism. With Hare and Griffith, there is an interest in, um, I think, class 
very much and of course there's other political trends but they do not sort of understand as we Australians understand this insidious uh, colonial impulse. We've suffered from their impulses as it were. And this brings us to the other point is that Vietnam is very interesting because we sent soldiers to Vietnam and yet we have no Australian playwright has written a play um, set in Vietnam that's been important. We've tried to make a film set in Vietnam and yet here is an Englishman, David Hare, who's written a play set in Vietnam. And I think this is symptomatic of Australians being unable to write truthfully and closely about their own history. We unfortunately are a nation that when confronted by history become rather wimpish and shy away from it. And of course I've always been interested in how history um, teaches us how to understand the present. But this has not been part of the Australian tradition, unlike the English. There's a sense of the future too in terms of our nuclear future. For instance, Brenton has written a play, The Genius, to do with uh, the nuclear presence in Europe generally. And yet Australia too has a nuclear presence. For instance, your play Sunrise ends up with something that looks not unlike a nuclear explosion. Are you interested in exploring this theme? Yes, uh, it's often forgotten. Again, this is our problem, our sort of amnesia. Um, only now we discover, in fact, that the English um, let off a series of atomic explosions in Australia in the 1950s. Mm. I read about this and was horrified to find out we really didn't care. Only now um, are we starting to care about the consequences of this, which was uh, the blinding killing of Aboriginals. Um, the idea that many workers who worked on the projects um, are affected, infected with cancer. This interested me, and the other aspect, of course, interested me is a lot of people, including Australians, regard Australia as somehow being isolated from the nuclear conflict that's about to happen, mm -hmm. even Europeans coming to live here to escape. And of course, we won't escape, but it's symptomatic that somehow we Australians regard ourselves as being isolated from one of the, the great problems of the 20th century. A stylistic question. I must ask you this, Louis. Um, people frequently uh, compare your plays to the plays of Edward Bond in content and in structure, which you've touched upon. Such plays as The Woman and The Sea are similar in having strong central heroines and of having a similar scenic construction. Have you learned much from Edward Bond? I, I think I've probably learned by acting in some of his plays and directing him, I've probably learned um, scenic construction uh, from him. As regards um, being interested in, say, um, strong heroic women and, say, the women of the sea, I, th I don't think you can actually pinch themes from other writers. I think you're drawn towards certain themes. It, with The Precious Woman, my play, I actually wrote it before I had read Bond's The Woman and it sort of came through reading the story of the stone which has been translated into Penguin Classics plus the journalism of Agnes Smedley who um, went to China as an American journalist. With the sea, uh, I knew the sea and perhaps there are parallels to inside the island but I've, um, like Marx, turned Hegel on his head, I've turned Bond on his head and used it for my own purposes. There is true that there's no such thing as non-political theatre in that all theatre arises from a specific political and cultural context and therefore must reflect it. Do you consciously write about political matters in this sense? How do you see Australian theatre now as a reflection of its society? I'm, I'm not a consciously political writer in that, like a Brecht or say Griffith, who are making political points quite directly and quite unmistakably. I'm, I'm a worker who works by resonance and metaphors and I have found that one of the things that interests me is political power and the use of power. But this also extends to how we use it on one another in um, other strands of our life, not only political life. And so one of the things that fascinates me is um, the interior life of people and how this is reflected in public life and how public life is reflected in our interior life. And so my political views as expressed in my plays are certainly not obvious and rather diffuse. As regard um, this trend in Australian writing, um, it's unfortunate that when Australian writers do tackle political themes or, 
or things that do have political consequences like say Gallipoli where we sent our soldiers in the First World War to be slaughtered for the sake of um, English um, Empire. Um, again, as when, when tackling history, we seem to be rather soft-centred about the whole thing and we're certainly not tough about it. I'm a little different in that my Gallipoli play, for example, is not about, on the surface, Gallipoli. It's set in 1912, before the First World War, and set on the New South Wales wheat farm and what the soldiers go through when they're poisoned with some um, bad wheat is what they're going to go through three years later at Gallipoli. I f do find that, again, I work through resonance and metaphor rather than through a direct application of political events. You're less than interested in recreating historical narratives such as the Farlap story, the Bodyline Cricket Tour story, Breaker Morant, the dismissal which dealt with the dismissal of the Whitlam government by Kerr in 75. This attracts you less, I assume. Than it attracts me less because as these, um, as these TV series have proved is that they seem to, um, they don't seem to be able to provide resonances. Now for example the Bodyline series which was about cricket and um, was between England and Australia um, could have brought out a lot of other resonances about the problems of a, of a young nation like Australia um, fighting, as it were, on the battlefield, the cricket battlefield, fighting the English masters. This, this was not brought out, and yet, obviously, there was some theme with it. And I think one of the problems is when you write about direct historical events like this, or the last bastion, which was um, General MacArthur in Australia, and Australia being isolated during the Second World War, I think it seems to exist only for itself. It, it, it can't seem to provide extra resonances for us, and we Australians seem to glory in the example rather than, as it were, the themes that provide the example. To change now to the question of your own plays, what is the main purpose in writing a play, and where do the ideas come from? Such plays as The Precious Woman, for example, or Royal Show, which was set an agricultural show at a very rural Australian um, institution. I find that my plays, I'm a very intuitive and emotional writer, my plays generally begin with a, a, an image. For example, Visions began with an image of a girl lying in the mud, covered in blood. Sometimes, however, um, you know, plays begin elsewhere with the Royal Show. Uh, that began, I was working as associate director for Lighthouse Estate Theatre Company. Um, the car, and the company of actors wanted to write a show which they contributed towards it with um, a lot of material and a lot of their own input. And so I wrote an outline and they did most of the work. And so I found this very interesting as an experiment. I've never written a play this way, which was basically the contributions of actors though it is a, a great strand in Australian playwright in the 60s and 70s, where, um, especially in the Pram Factory, a lot of important plays came from this process. With uh, The Song Room, um, that was a radio play that has gone on outside of Australia and even in Germany. That began because I used to work in a mental institution and they used to have what is called Song Room, where therapists tried to teach mental patients how to talk through song and that's sort of it's been a theme that's been with me for a while. With The Precious Woman I was um, very attracted towards a book that I picked up when I was writing residence at Queensland University on the wives of warlords during the 1920s and 1930s in China and I was very interested in, in showing how a a weak woman tries to become a strong woman when she assumes power and how power in some reflects corrupts her. Um, that was one that I was particularly fascinated with the theme at the time. With Spellbound, it's very interesting, a lot of people regard this as anomaly like royal show, but I've always been fascinated by country life because I used to live in the country during vacations and when I was sent away from home. And I've also been fascinated by country and western music, um, like Patsy Cline, Jim Reeves and Tammy Wynette. And I wanted to write a play that was sort of broad like that, that dealt in very raw, highly strung emotions. And so this character, Sylvia, is very much in the tradition of country and western um, soap opera. 
uh, whose emotions are so strong that they're like the flood that, um, that takes over the orange groves. And also that play began a long, long time ago when I was at high school and I read a poem by the great Australian poet John Shaw Nielsen called The Orange Tree, which is a very lyrical, very mysterious poem. And I wanted some of that quality. And it's a play that is not understood because it seems to be outside of the general run of my plays, but it's one that's close to my heart because it is a, a heartfelt play. Which of your plays are your favourites, really? My, my favourites are plays Inside the Island, Sunrise and the Golden Age, which is, I regard as being three plays in a quartet of Australian plays. The fourth, The Watchtower, um, I intend to write soon. But what I wanted to do, I was terribly attracted towards the way Balzac decided to do a history of his times, and I wanted to do a history of my times. So Inside the Island is set in 1912, just before the First World War. The Golden Age is set between 1939 and 1945, and it ranges from Tasmania to the ruins of Berlin. And I wanted to show how Australians were caught up not only in their own culture, but in the destruction of other cultures. The Sunrise is set now, and I wanted to write a play about how even now Australians uh, think themselves as being isolated from the rest of the world in this island of privilege and self-concerns. The Watchtower is a play that I'm going to write, which is set in 1939, and which is a sort of um, like a, an Aussie sheepdog that sort of tackles the remains of a, a cow outside in the paddock. I've sort of tackled the remains of a novel by Thomas Mann, The Magic Mountain, and so it's set in a TB sanatorium in 1939. And that'll be the finish of the quartet, yeah. There's a great sense of landscape in, in your theatre which is not dissimilar to what our painters do when they situate figures in a landscape. I'm thinking now specifically of people like Drysdale, where there's an enormous empty and arid but very beautiful looking landscape almost dwarfing the figures. You've always put your plays in, in it where an outside setting, have you not? Yes. Um I find that if my characters are inside, I become claustrophobic even while writing it. Um, one of the things is I became very attracted, because I was a city boy, uh, brought up in the a working class housing commission home, when I did get out into the country, I saw it um, afresh, as it were. And I was always terribly attracted towards the hugeness the, and the bleakness of the Australian landscape as if it had been created by a god who was a King Lear. He seems to me to have that quality and I always saw Australians as being humbled by the landscape and so I always saw us in relationship to the landscape. It seemed to have that effect on us. Uh, so I see figures in a landscape all the time and also I, I try to relate um, figures to the background uh, of, especially in Australia. So in a play like Visions, for example, which is um, set in tropical Paraguay, again, people relate to that particular background, the tropics and the swamps, and in inside the island, um, a lot of it is set in the wheat fields, um, which, is a, which is our great cash crop, and um, which is, as you've probably seen, it's hardly been painted or written about at all. Yeah. Is the Aboriginal figure a part of your landscape or is he more sort of obscured and uh, submerged? I'm not, I don't sort of trot, trot out the Aboriginals as background yeah, or yeah. exotic backgrounds like say yeah. Return to Eden or the way say Averna Herzog is interested in the Aboriginals. Um, I'm more interested in how they're rooted into the landscape, how they have their own culture and in Sunrise and Inside the Island, one of the little themes running through it is how the whites have taken over this mm -hmm. landscape, taken over this culture, but not given a culture in return, and not having been rooted in the landscape like the Aboriginals. And so it is a, a theme that, as we talked about in this interview, that obviously preoccupies me, how we're not rooted to our landscape. Yeah. And yet your landscape has interesting rituals occurring in it. For example, there's a, a a feature which occurs in every single country town of Australia, which is the war memorial of the digger and his dog and his reversed rifle. 
which I think is very relevant to inside the island. One feels if they actually went into town, there would the war memorial be. And cricket games too, kids playing cricket out in the bush. That also occurs inside the island. Yes, is it a cricket game or is it a war? That's right, mm. yes. It, it's one of the fascinating things about Australian country is to see this game that ha was invented in England being played out on dusty paddocks or on dusty cricket grounds where there's no shade and where people are suffering in the heat. That's a constant um, strand that runs through my work of how we've imported not only culture but games into these strange little hot worlds that we have. Mm. There's also another part of Australia which is of course fairly important that we're the most urbanised country in the world or the first most urbanised country. The sense of urban landscape in your work seems bizarrely enough to turn up in your novel The Misery of Beauty which is set in the, the sleazy parts of Carlton and also your radio play Albert Names Edward and The Song Room, both radio plays. Yes, uh, um I think I seem to be much surer of country landscape than I do of um, urban landscape. It's, it's a very intuitive, emotional thing, but I find that if I try to set, say when I was doing the adaptation of Lulu, uh, I wanted to put it in a uh, contemporary urban uh, situation, but I found that I couldn't place her in real bars and real nightclubs, although I know them. Um, and and I, I wrote about them in Misery of Beauty. In a play, I just can't seem to place a figure in it. They don't seem to relate to the background as well as they seem to relate to the background um, in my other plays, which is a, um, a country background. I don't know how to explain this even to myself. Right. <laughs> There's a poem by Dorothy McKellar which every Australian school child once recited called My Country which one of the lines is, for flood and fire and famine she pays us back threefold. There are certainly floods and fires in your theatre, particularly I'm thinking of the flood in Spellbound and the bushfires that tend to operate perhaps as reality and perhaps in metaphor in Inside the Island and indeed there's one in, in Sunrise as well. Um, why this interest in bushfires? Is it just because bushfires are so much part of our annual reality anyway? I think it probably right, it goes right back to my childhood where mm. we used to live next to endless paddocks and every summer the local louts used to set fire to it so I was, I was used to fires from there. But also in Australia, which I think a lot of other like Europeans and Americans don't understand this, is that mm. this is to Australians an almost apocalyptic thing, bushfires. It not only destroys a lot of property and livestock, destroys a lot of people and also threatens in cities, for example Adelaide or Melbourne and recently in 1983 there was of course the Ash Wednesday fires which destroyed huge amounts of property, houses, livestock and about 70 lives. Mm. And in Australia we seem to mark a lot of our epochs by calling them Black Friday, Black Tuesdays, Black Wednesdays is when the monstrous bushfires um, destroy so much of um, our land. And so for Australians, this, this sense of bushfire certainly doesn't work as a metaphor at all. It, it's a horrendous reality. And I, I have used this, this image in, say, Sunrise and Inside the Island because it, it does give that apocalyptic feel to Australians. We know it, we feel mm. it, and every year we fear it. That's true. Well, what are you, projects are you now working on? For instance, you're doing television work, more radio plays, perhaps a film. What next? Well, I've just finished the tally movie, Displaced Persons, and I'm now writing another one, because I found that really interesting, and um, I'm also interested or to produce interest in me in doing a film script. Interestingly, years ago, uh, an opera was based on my play Inner Voices by the great Australian composer, Brian Howard. And we're going to work on a opera based on Jean Rhys' novel, White Cigar So Sea, if we can get the rights. And I've uh, now got to write and complete The Watchtower, which is part of the Australian Quartet. Do you tell us what Displaced Persons is about? Displaced Persons is a tally movie that I wrote and it is set in 1946 in the quarantine station which is on the North Heads in Sydney Harbour. 
And what it is about is a group of European refugees arrive, DPs, displaced persons. They arrive in Australia and they have a disease and so they quarantine. The disease is deadly and they start to die from it. And what the Australians have to find out is whether the disease will spread to Australians and if it will, is to stop it. Um, what happens is that it's sort of this phobia against um, Europeans and displaced persons. So again, it's um, that typical thing that seems to run from my work of Australians isolated from the world and when the outside world comes into contact with Australians, the results are not pleasant. What attracted you to the wide Sargasso Sea? Is it the kind of post-colonial metaphor that Jean Rhys is working in? Or are you interested in the internal lives of those characters? Well, it's both. Again, it's typically me, is that it's, it's not only the post-colonial world that she's writing about, but it's also how this world twists and tortures the interior life of people. Mm. And this is, an, uh, again, another theme that I seem to be interested in. What would you most like to do in the next 10 years? Have a rest. Thank you, Louie, very much. <laughs>